Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of our own military history. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Welcome back to Fighting on Film, everyone. Me and Matt are back with another episode today. And we are going to be remembering the great Sean Connery, who unfortunately passed away um, earlier this year. At the fine old age of 90. Yes, he had a a very long run, uh, bless him. And we thought we would take a look at one of his lesser known films and lesser known war movies with 1965's The Hill. And it's directed by Sidney Lumet, who is astronomically famous for directing movies such as Network, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon, 12 Angry Men. So Matt, do you want to tell us a little bit about the plot of the film and the production, things like that? So basically, The Hill is a film about a British Army military prison in North Africa during the North Africa campaign. And we don't get a specific date, but we think it's probably 1942, 43, sometime around then. Yeah, could be. Uh, there's there's no indications in sort of dialogue about you know what's going on at the time, but we know that it's it's in North Africa and and the prison is sort of where all of the uh, petty thieves, malingerers, people have gone a war. Yeah, yeah. Most prominent um, offender to arrive at the hill, the prison is uh, Sean Connery playing uh, Joe Roberts, who is a, a recently uh, broken. Sergeant Major from I think it's the Royal Tank Regiment, and the the word has gone out uh, uh, through the army. I think we get that kind of feel that you know people have been talking about the case mm-hmm. where he he's basically refused to go into action and then struck an officer, mm. and it's been like a very prominent court martial. Yeah, yeah. And you know we get the the uh, the RSM and and the staff sergeants discussing that this chap's going to be arriving. He has a reputation. He he? does. His 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 reputation basically precedes him. And before that, though, we get like a we get like a sort of like panning shot of the of the actual Mm. uh, prison itself and and the the eponymous hill. Yes. uh, The hill of the title. That's it. The that shot is just you know it sets the whole movie up. You can you feel the heat. There's a man goes up the hill and he doesn't quite make it and he collapses and he rolls back to the bottom. Yeah, and the men get doubled out to go and grab him away. And you're like, oh god, this is this part of the, the hill is going to be so important to the film. Yeah, it sets the tone for the whole film. Definitely. You know, you have this constant background of men doing PT and drill. Yeah, yeah. And there's the overbearing heat, and we get this portrayed through some really tight close-ups of um, the prisoners and the and the actual like the, the prison warders, the the staff sergeants, and the NCOs controlling the prison. And then we we have a fresh batch of five prisoners arrive. Yeah. But before this, two prisoners are being released. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They double over and they have a, a brief chat with um, the RSM, which is uh, RSM Wilson. Bear Wilson. Yeah. Who's played by the brilliant Harry Andrews. Absolutely fantastic. Classic British character actor. Which the entire cast is really driven by that classic batch of. 50s, 60s British character actors. So just to go over the cast briefly, we've got Harry Andrews as Wilson. Um, Then we have uh, Jack Watson as Jock McGrath. And Jack Watson's been in dozens of dozens of films. He was Sandy in The Wild Geese. Exactly. Which, you know, automatically makes him an absolute hero. Um, we've got uh, Roy Kinnear. He always brings like a a, a wry comic side to his his part. He's like a cheeky, cheeky chap, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Sir Michael Redgrave, who you know has been in so many great films, mm-hmm. and then we have Ian Hendry and Ian Bannon, who are a pair of competing staff sergeants. So they're they're subordinates to uh, Regimental Sergeant Major Wilson, who basically controls the prison. And we have these two staff sergeants. Williams, played by Ian Hendry, is uh, a new staff sergeant, isn't he? Yeah, he's a new arrival. He's a new arrival, and at the start, the RSM goes through the sort of job role a little bit with the staff sergeants. No one's going to give us any medals here. One job is just as important as the next. This is my show. Don't step out of line. Do as I say, and you'll be okay, sort of thing. And then he sort of he dresses down these two lads that are getting yeah. sent out, 
and he's like oh you're you're soldiers again now you know you're you're you know almost like saying oh you're good boys now you know you you, you did what you were told now, now there's good lads off you go yeah interestingly all three of them have like different approaches don't they wilson is the rsm he's about you know you break men down slowly you build them back up to soldiers again you've got harris who mm. is let them be in the prison that's enough sort of thing and then you've got williams who is like this sort of stern horrible man who's just loving every minute of being able to like manipulate and yeah twist and and, and destroy these men and b- b- genuinely physically break them and and that's sort of his arc is what leads the film's plot, really. It's a weird film, isn't it? Because it is. No one is the central character, even though Connery is the name. It's mm. it's not really about him and it doesn't become to be about him until the last half hour. Yes, that's true. I would definitely agree with that. There is no plot until the last half hour. Really. The, the, the three most key characters are the RSM and the two staffs. Yeah, yeah. They're basically... It's a power struggle, but you don't sort of realise it's a power struggle until probably the midpoint of the film, which is interesting. Yeah. Initially, you feel like it's just a matter of these newly arrived prisoners basically surviving. Yeah. Surviving the, the prison. And their crimes as well. The crimes of the other four blokes, apart from Sean Connery's, like Sean's crime is probably the most criminal thing out of the lot of the... It's definitely the most serious, yeah. They're sort of non-crimes. Yeah. But then the film sort of, it presents you these men and it's like, well, well, they haven't done anything that bad. Does it fit the punishment? Because the minute the minute they're sort of in there, they get doubled up the hill. And like, you're thinking, oh my God, like this is this is awful. This is torture. You know, and you've got Williams is standing there loving every minute of it. Yeah. The sort of, it turns, doesn't it? The sort of, Oh, you're going to love it here. You're going to like do as I say from the RSM Wilson. And then it's immediately to, to Williams just being like, I'm going to break these men and make them nothing because I'm everything. It's like little power trips. The whole movie, the whole movie is like power trips. Yeah. It's definitely a power trip. And with Wilson, you kind of get the feel that he's trying to be firm, but fair. That's it. Yeah. He, he even has a bit of a, a joke. There's a bit of like soldier's humor with the new arrivals and with the two men yeah, that are leaving. Yeah. So, you know, he's 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 portrayed as initially at least being, you know, fair. And he probably is throughout the film, but he is as we go on, he does like struggle to retain control of the, you know, the prison itself. So I suppose we should we should sort of describe the hill. Yeah, we should. In case anyone listening hasn't seen it. So the film the film uh, is 123 minutes long. It's a long watch, but it's a really mm. enjoyable one, and it's well worth uh, sitting down to, to to enjoy. Definitely. But in case you haven't um, seen it yet, the hill is basically what is described as uh, something that the prisoners have actually constructed. Yes. So it's a, a giant hill flanked by. Um, two sides that are rocks and stones. I've got what Wilson says. Oh, go ahead. See that hill? I noticed it as I came in. We built it special. Two tons of sand and rock and a lot of labour and sweat. There you go. And on, and on set, it was like a fiberglass, so not fiberglass, it was a, a, a sand hill built up on rocks. Yeah. Uh, Williams, late at night, goes up and down it. It's shot from him going up and down from the middle of the hill. Mm-hmm. And you can see, like, genuinely like it's steep it's very even if the movie wasn't a movie you you'd struggle to get up there yeah it's steep and it's sand and you know if you've walked through loose sand you know how unpleasant sand can be and unstable yeah yeah especially in ammo boots so getting people to double up and down that in boots and and kit that's that's not fun so i i I found out that the hill was made up from using three thousand five hundred meters of imported uh, tube steel my word more than 60 tons of timber and stone covered with sand so they must have built like a scaffold and then um basically packed it out with built it up yeah with with timber stone and sand amazing really and it's that's the that's the focal point of whenever you're outside of the prison it's really imposing it apparently was filmed in an old spanish fort in um, in southern spain like near malaga or um almeria Mm. And it was it was basically it, you can see on the, the establishing shot there's a that part of the walls falling down. What they've done is they've put up like a, a chain fence 
you know, yeah. a typical pr- like prison, prison of war, chain yeah. fence. Yeah. I think that's that's also something interesting to note that you know they they went to the you know extent of finding a um a suitable like prison that looked like somewhere that they might repurpose you know in in, in Libya in the middle of nowhere if you escape where are you gonna go yeah you know, you're gonna die if you do anyway aren't you yeah it's an it's an interesting film because we have it moves away from a dynamic we're used to of you know of war films that involve prisoners are almost always prisoners of war yeah that's it yeah so there's only a couple of films you know i can think of that deal with prisoners that aren't actually prisoners of war they're actually military prisoners military prisoners exactly you know things like paths of glory uh there's that red uh, robert redford film from from the early 2000s the castle or the last castle rather uh which is very similar actually in plot to the hill i've not seen that one maybe we have to compare it but yeah, it's a very rare, rare genre piece. You know, you don't you don't get movies like this, a film mm. about military discipline and, and military prisons and things like that. It's, it's quite it's a refreshing plot. You know, it, it's very strikingly different. From almost every war movie of that 50s, 60s genre. No, almost no one is likable to an extent. There's no characters that you really do side with. I don't I don't think I know. The only one character I felt actually I could see your point was what was Harris. Mm um because he was trying to show a bit of care yeah a bit of compassion but even then he was part of the system and was doing what he was told and was yeah. being mean when he he shouldn't really have been being mean a really odd film in that regard it is and it's very much a character film in that there's not a huge amount of story it's just the story of Sean Connery and the other prisoners you know arriving at the prison and surviving that's it or you know in the face of adversity yeah but then there's also the plot of the power struggle between the senior NCOs at the, at the prison and, you know, the way that all unfolds. I mean, we don't, we don't really see any officers other than um, uh, Michael Redgrave's character as the uh, medical officer, the CMO. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And we briefly see the camp commandant. I think it's very interesting that every time we see the camp commandant, he, he's paying a prostitute. Yeah. He's getting out of bed. You know, and, he... and there's a scene. Yeah, yeah exactly. And just hands her, hands her a fiver. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious. And there's a scene where he keeps the entire prison waiting for like the, the weekly um, inspection. Yeah. And, you know, they're all stood in the baking sun. And, you know, there's loads of these great close-up shots of, of the, the sweat pouring down their faces. You know, they're all stood to attention, yeah, yeah. waiting. And it's not just the salt, it's not just the um, the prisoners, it's also, you know, the, the staff, yeah. they're all there, stood yeah, waiting. All, yeah, the heat is the, the heat is like a big... It's a common element. It's a common element, isn't it? And the, you know, oh, I'm so hot. You know, you can hear flies buzzing around. You don't never see them, but you, you can hear them buzzing around yeah. prison cells. And, you know, you get this sort of the, the bake, the bake heat sort of noise. Mm-hmm. And it, it's quite, it's very atmospheric. It's a, it's a very atmospheric film. One of the things I, I read about when I was doing some research about the film is that they recorded the sound more or less live. Oh, wow. So you get a lot of that drill that's going on in the background. And that's one of the complaints audiences had especially in the US, because apparently they struggle to understand some of the, the regional dialects and accents. Oh, right, okay. So, you know, like Sean Connery's Scots accent, and, you know, I think I think they struggle with... Um, uh, McGrath. McGrath as well. Yeah. Robert? You know, yeah. Robert? And he sort, of, he sort of has that sort of, like, mumble. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? And I think they the producers of the film... I've seen how to how are you, Roberts. <laughs> it's like proper... <laughs> Exactly. And he's like in a Yorkshire tea ad, bless him. The studio wanted to actually put subtitles or overdub it with American accents. No. So the American audiences couldn't understand it. In Europe, apparently, it fared much better mm. because it was all subtitled anyway. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. So, so they could read it and understand it. You know, it did very well in Europe and very well in, in, in the UK, but it, it, it sort of didn't take off in, in, mm. in, in the US because of the mm. the accents and probably um some of the you know the background noise getting through as well i i didn't i didn't think that was an issue i thought the background mm. noise and you know the live audio added to that you know that it was just it was atmosphere it was it like was. the atmosphere of the, the you know the means we talk a lot about it on this pod like the atmosphere and the, the mise on scene and the sound design in these war movies is mm. really important and and this is one of the movies that really gets it right you, you can't rely on an explosion or a crack of a gunshot you have to have completely different noise and sound effects for this movie to work and 
people sort of doubling everywhere and the smash of boots on sand and yes. like people stamping their feet when they when they stand to attention cleaning the drill and things like that that's what come through but to hear that american audiences didn't enjoy that for me is sort of they didn't understand why it's there because mm. it's it's all there for a reason plus it was in black and white yeah and that, that didn't have to be at all no but it really helps because that old stock stock black and white film reel it's very atmospheric in in and of itself every single little crease of of a man's uniform exactly things like that mm. it picks it up and it's it's all for a reason So Matt, did you did you find out anything about military punishment? Yeah. So one of the things that you know is pretty interesting about the film is that it focuses on a on a military mm. prison. Obviously, there's a long history of of punishment and military punishment. The British Army has you know that you know there's that old um, tradition of flogging. Yeah, yeah. You know that didn't go out until until the uh, the late 1800s, mid 1800s, and feel punishments you know during the, the Great War fairly strenuous and unpleasant. The, the history of, of military prison. Military prisons. <laughs> prisons. Then last Sean. The spirit of the spirit of Sean is <laughs> taking me. <laughs> the tradition of military prisons in the British Army goes back to uh, around the, the 1850s with the establishment of of Aldershot military military prison, uh, what became known as the Glass House, which has since become sort of the 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 slang term for, for any British Army military prison. That's my word, isn't it? And Put you in the glass house. Exactly. And glass house comes from the, the glass, basically the roof of, of one of the older shot wings, which is really interesting. There's this long history of glass houses and, and, and British military prisons where they're serving soldiers, but you know they're, they're being punished during their service for acts that they've committed. Yeah. yeah. And offences that they committed, you know, while soldiers. So you have this level of discipline and harshness that you probably don't see in civilian prisons. The punishment these guys are getting in the film, I'm sitting there thinking, well, they didn't do this in porridge. <laughs> do you know what I mean? No. <laughs> Everything that I've seen in prison movies, the hill really takes the cake. Yeah, no one walks God, anywhere. No, everyone doubles. You know, if there's a word that is synonymous with a hill, it's double. You hear it every other four, four, fifth. You like, do. Double, double, double. The sound design is brilliant because it, it, you're like, fucking hell. All right. You know, it get, you get a bit annoyed with Williams and Harris because you're like, Jesus, all right, that's enough. Well, it's it's very representative of that kind of discipline and drill of that period where the constant shouting and, and barked orders and you have to double everywhere. You have to double on the spot. Crikey, yeah. It's absurd. It, it, it ramps it up to absurd levels, but it, it's obviously that's what the movie's going for. It's going for that absurdity of discipline. Connery's character is accused of refusing to go into action in the face of the enemy. That's it. And striking an officer. And we, we basically, we learn that, but we don't learn the reasons behind that until much very later on further into the film yeah. so we're there wondering is our hero because he's the big named actor is our hero um mm. an anti-hero you know has he really done this and why did he do this definite anti-hero for me mm. even though it's sean connery as a character there's not a lot of redeeming qualities for him because later on you hear that he didn't go in it with his tank to this in this mm -hmm. action but all of his crew did and they were all killed you're a coward then but you're not a coward well that's def that's definitely how he feels yeah he didn't go in because he was under arrest oh right so he has this sort of like guilt trip mm. that's how i understood it anyway i mean i'm like oh, okay i thought he but he was like well they went in and i didn't oh, i'm i don't know well the, the, it sort of it gets revealed doesn't it that the officer was was ordering them into into a, um, a situation that was basically suicide and you know it it definitely turned out to be the case mm. but connery refused to to lead the the troop in mm. eventually struck the officer and was you know put under put under arrest he said he blacked out didn't he and the next thing he knew he mm. was people were 
grabbing him off the major. It conjures up an image of, of Connery absolutely leather in this bloke. And that, I think, the blackout sort of perhaps leads into the struggle that Connery's having because in one of the most climactic scenes of the film, he, he, he basically con- confronts our, the RSM. Yeah, oh, that's a fantastic scene. It's, it's a brilliant scene. He is arguing that soldiers can't be tin soldiers fighting and operating by the book. You know, he, yeah. there's a great line where he says, um, this isn't Queen Victoria's army anymore, you know. Yeah. Where, it's all wrong. Queen Victoria's dead. Exactly. Yeah. There's that clash of ideologies, whereas Connery had previously held the same values as, as the RSM yeah. to a degree. You know, he, he, they both like quote some of the King's regulations back and forth. Yeah, and, it's, it's brilliant. And, you know, by paragraph, Connery sort of like has this, this breakdown of way he's tired of the futility of always following regulation. And carrying out orders for no reason. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's where the plot for me starts saying something more than mm. the movie. Whereas, because this is this comes out in a time where like you know the British Empire is declining and the retreat from empire exactly sort of so post colonial phase and... and I think Sean Connery might even say something like that as well he mentions the empire isn't important as he does yeah he sort of like mocks the idea of mm. of you know it, it being for king and empire and you know and yeah you've got Harry and Harry Andrews's RSM is the archetypal sergeant major you know he mm-hmm. he just looks like he would batter you to death. If you didn't, if you didn't stand to, if you didn't um, stand to attention the right way, he would absolutely berate you. He's the walking equivalent of the king's regs. Yeah, he's like that. He's he is like a, a personification of, yeah, yeah. of rules and regulations, isn't he? Him and Dickie Amber out of Guns at Patelzi would would just absolutely get on, wouldn't he? You? You'd see him in the mess. Oh God, yeah. He even drinks whiskey as well, which I thought was hilarious. Yeah, they both drink whiskey, which is brilliant. Well, it's a classic. It's a classic stereotype, isn't it? I, mean, I suppose definitely. Um, one of the, I suppose, one of the interesting things about the RSM character is he knows he's never going to win any medals working in a military prison. Yeah, yeah. But it's his duty, and he accepts the task of breaking these men down and building them back up into soldiers. Yeah. And that's kind of like how he justifies his own career. And yeah, and what he does, yeah, he's doing he's doing something for the army, so therefore yeah. it is just. Whereas Williams, who basically it's discussed at the the beginning of the film that he comes from, you know, civilian life. He's been a been a warden at Wormwood Scrubs, I think it, it mentions, you know, a, a British prison in London. And they sort of like discuss the dynamic of the prison back in Britain being bombed and him coming into the into the army. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I thought it was gonna be oh, he's gonna be fish out of water. Like he's gonna see how brutal this prison is. But no, he becomes mm. the brutal prison. And it, it's very quick. So I I thought, oh my God, like, you know, he's, he's an evil man in this movie. Williams is. And he's yeah, it's sadistic. Yeah. Really sadistic. And it, he, he from like scene one where we see him, you sort of don't really notice he could be anybody. And then the minute mm. he's given command or charge of Sean Connery and his, his prison mates, he absolutely turns into this horrible, sneering, almost like playground bully. Yeah, the power corrupts, doesn't it? Really corrupts him so fast. And, you know, he doubles them up the hill in their full kit in the blazing sun and he doubles them back down. And then he singles out Sean Connery and says, you're going up again, double. And he has the rest of them jump into a a pond. Yeah, that's it. You know, and and, and cool cool down and and Connery, the the emotion on his face, like the the abject depression of seeing like the rest of them in the cool water as he's having to continue doubling up the hill. It's just... I mean, Connery in this film is, he is a standout, but my God, there's some amazing performances in this film. All round, everyone puts in an absolute display. It's such a rich seam of, of performances. You know, Harry Andrews is RSM, you know, we've we've picked it out a lot, but he, he served in the Royal Artillery during the Second World War anyway. So he's used to this. Oh, right. um, but he really is, you know, he's pulling out all the stops to be this yeah. hard as nails RSM. Connery, and I think... Almost sometimes he's a bit redundant in it. The story's not about him, mm. so it, it could be anyone. But then he does come well, in. As you say, he doesn't become a focal point until no. later, doesn't he? No, but he's got he's the one with the the brains or at least the heart to stand mm. up for it or know that it's wrong. And then you've got it's you've got Williams's horrible staff, and then you're introduced to Harris, who's been at the prison for we assume a few years at this point. Yeah. Well, to the point where he's calling the RSM is by his first name. That's it, yeah. And the RSM calls him Charlie as well. 
Yeah. So, so they they definitely know each other well. I think the first thing he says in the whole movie is, is, is in, in the scene where he's uh, chatting to the RSM. He offers him, offers him a sweet. That little act of kindness goes a long way. And he's like, oh, you know, you're gonna, you shouldn't be too hard on these boys. You know, he's like, oh, don't tell me how to do my job. So, yeah, everyone's sort of got someone to play off in a way. So mm-hmm. Sean's got McGrath to play off because McGrath is the the only person who, in his world of his cell, who can sort of stand up to him properly. Yeah, they're, they're the most alike, aren't they? Yeah. You know, you've got Harris has got Williams to play off of. The RSM sort of mm-hmm. has the commandant, but not really. So he's he's only answerable to himself. Mm-hmm. Kinnear and Ozzy Davis... Jacko King, they don't have anyone to play off, but they've got their own sort of their own arcs. And Jacko's is way more interesting than Kinnear's character. K- Kinnear is a little bit, I think he's in it to be the comic relief, but he just, just gets annoying. I mean, to a degree. So he's always asking to be, you know, transferred to a different cell. Well, I've had enough, I've had a stomach full of this, I have. You know, he keeps saying. And, that. you know, they all play a role in the film. So they all sort of play a role in the, in the, the ramping tensions. Mm. Kinnear's quite overweight and he, you know he breaks down on like a, a rope climb and he's like I'm, he, I'm fat you know he, he, he sort of like cr- yeah laments and cries out I'm fat and you feel for him in that you do feel for him though yeah it's it's a very it's a good scene every like, time someone cracks you feel for him mm. maybe we should talk about the last half hour spoilers if anyone's not seen the movie go watch it now we haven't really spoiled anything up till now we usually would talk about favorite scenes yeah it's difficult to pick a standout scene it isn't like there's is the glory and it isn't like a a trench 11 it's not one of those kind of films because the the plot doesn't lend itself to enjoyment almost you enjoy the movie but you you're not enjoying what these men are going through but i think if we single out the last half hour we're actually the, the plot happens from the moment when um stevens finally collapses i think that's a, a really fascinating scene all on its own mm. he's almost picked out because he's a nobody he's the weakest i think i think that's why he get, gets sort of like singled out and he, but even at the start um the rsm says do as you're told you don't need to you shouldn't be here do as you're told you'll be fine get out of the army get out of the army yeah as soon as you can and then They've had a really hard day of being doubled up the hill. Not a lot of water, not a lot of food, things like that. You know, everything everything they sort of need to survive is sort of given to them in in drips and drops. You know, they sort of yeah. they don't get enough of anything. These lads to the point where they're sort of like they when they go out to like collect their their, their rations, they have to double across the oh, yard. Yeah, yeah. And their food sort of like jumping out of their canteen tins. Yeah, that horrible looking stew they got. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> but they, even then, oh, there's that bit. Sorry, it's it's just there's great bits with the the sergeant major again. He goes, "Everything okay with your lunch?" To to Kinnear. You got, have you got enough bread? And he says, "It looks a bit light, so." <laughs> <laughs> and he gives that. He gets him to weigh yeah. it and cuts a bit off. Gives it back to him. There you go. There you go. <laughs> They pushed a breaking point. They really pushed a breaking point. And they're all having like a chat about how it is in the prison. And there's this really, really bright light in their cell. They think it's the sun because they've gone delirious. Mm-hmm. And Sean's like, it's not, it's a Gestapo lamp. And like, <laughs> that's my great Sean Connery there. And he's like, you know, they're, they've they got you where they want you because they've broken you already. We've only been in here like a couple of days. Yeah. Like what the hell sort of thing. He's amazed that these men have gone mad in the space of time and Stevens is sort of he's like I can't do it I'm, I can't do it anymore oh my god oh my god and then he's just sort of like staring into a wall isn't he at that he's point he's absolutely gone crackers and then Roy Kinnear sort of his character starts giving giving drill orders because you know they recognise that they think it's a joke they think it's funny mm. you know Sean doesn't they think that obviously Sean doesn't no. know he's just lying there but he does laugh once they all start laughing once once uh, Kinnear starts barking orders and, and Paul Stevens sort of like starts doubling around the cell, you know, about turn, yeah, like march on the spot and um, and eventually he collapses and dies. His death starts the real story in motion where mm. Sean Connery wants to pin the death of Stevens on Williams because Williams was pushing him hard. There's a scene previously uh, earlier on in the film where. Um, Stevens gets picked out because his kit isn't doesn't look right or well in the inspection um, because he's been rubbing it on the, the cell wall to make it more white 
or something. Yeah, um, but basically his, his kit's dirty from the day before and he's so exhausted he can't clean yeah, it. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So there's, there's sort of like a, an interesting moment of leadership where Connery basically, well, Roberts basically takes over and, you know, directs um, McGrath to help him clean the kit by rubbing it on the whitewash. Rubs like a poor man's version of like Blanco. So he gets singled out. Williams doubles him up the hill and in his gas mask. Yes, that's that's a hell of a scene. You, you know, he puts it on and you get a shot through the the, the respirators. I, the, the cinematography of that bit is, is brilliant. And you hear the heavy breathing and him going up and down and it, you just say, oh God, this guy's going to collapse. He's going to die. You really yeah. feel for him, but he doesn't die. He just, he just cracks. He does not at that point. Yeah, you know, he's cracked him. Williams wants these men to fear him. You know, fear is like this big theme in the whole yeah. film. You fear the RSM and you fear the staff and you fear the the heat of the blazing sun. You fear the hill. It's evil, isn't it? Yeah, it's the fear of discipline, isn't it? Consequences of actions, etc. But none of these men have done anything to warrant them being broken to the point where they're going to die of heat exhaustion. No one cares if they do. No, and that's the thing. So the, the Michael Redgrave's um, CMO, the the medical officer, you know, he's he's basically just phoning it in, mm. isn't he? You know, he, the, the the one of the, the great scenes at the beginning of the film is he has each of the new prisoners in to come and see whether they're past, you know, past fit for punishment. A one fit for punishment. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that basically boils down to you know, um, just dropping their trousers and and turning on a, <laughs> a lamp, you know, one, doing a one eighty. And, you know, that's how he examines them. Connery goes, where are you sending me? The stud farm. But yeah, and then he goes, oh, anything I should know about? And he goes, well, I wouldn't boast if I did. And then and then he's sent out for rigorous punishment. No one cares enough, do they? Apart from the RSM. No, no. And that's, the, that's where it, it's wrong. So Stephen's, you know, singled out for all this horrible punishment, drops down dead in the cell. You know, after that, it really sort of hits the fan, didn't it? Yeah, and the, the film ramps from there and what i thought was interesting about that scene where you know they're all laughing and and Kinnear's getting him to double around the cell and shouting orders at him like one of the the ncos is they're all kind of responsible for his death yeah obviously williams is is responsible for you know breaking him and causing him heat stroke and pushing him to the point where a few barked orders in a cell were enough to kill him yeah, I think it's a heart attack. I assume he had a heart attack. Yeah, he just collapses, isn't he? It's just, you know, it's just very obvious that he's he's dead uh, because we get like a close up of his face mm. and Connery checks him and, and he says he's, he's 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 dead. And from there, it's sort of it's sort of all about um, using Stevens's death to prove that Williams is being a complete tyrant. So after that, they they cut. You know, you've got Williams and. Harris and the RSM at this local bar and they get sort of taken out. Williams just he just doesn't care. You can tell, you can see he's fully aware that he'll probably get away mm. with this because he, he you know he doesn't see that he's killed this guy. Um and obviously from the viewer's point of view, yeah, you could argue that Harris didn't kill him. It was his cellmates who were trying to have a bit of a laugh at his expense. But from what Williams has done to the guy, he has killed him. Then from that scene, it's this big sort of scene in the in the cell block where all the guys, Stephen, 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 they all start chanting his name, don't they? Yeah, the mutiny, more or less. Mutiny sort of thing. And that is where the plot is sort of based because this is where the allegation of murder is picked up on. It's quite it's quite complex, isn't it? So, Very complex, yeah. It they you know, the RSM is trying to keep a handle on things and, and cover he's it up. making Basically, and he's making everything vague. You know, he's he's asking, you know, is there any blood on Stevens? Did is there a bullet wound in Stevens? Did anyone see Harris physically murder Stevens? Well, that's what he goes. He goes, bullet wounds, marks, or abrasions. <laughs> I'll take you to the commandant, and you can all speak freely. Yeah. You know. Well, this is it. He's using the book. Yeah, the KRs, because I'll have you. Yeah, he's he's trying to trip them in it. You know, he's he's, yeah, he's yeah, yeah. telling them they can do all of these things freely, but mm. the commandant's not going to believe you. Yeah, because because he believe because he's he's mine. Yeah. He's in my pocket. You well, know, he doesn't, he doesn't he, care. He's too busy with the prostitute. And then you've got this beautiful scene where Harry Andrews gets his bathroom on. He's in the middle of all yeah. these guys. 
It's a tense scene because, you know, they're all shouting. And, you know, at that point, I think he's still in control of the prison because he Definitely. he diffuses the situation. He does. You know, you're thinking, oh, God, there'll be a riot. You know, because if, if these guys wanted to riot, there's maybe only like 20 staff there. You know, they pretty much mm-hmm. could do it. And I'm thinking, oh, they get God. the hoses out, don't they? Yeah, they get the hoses out. And they've got their, you know, their battens or are they mm. yard sticks? I don't know what they were. They, they look like some of them have like yard sticks and some of them have like battens. Yeah, definitely. You know, they, they don't get any arms out because there's this bit. Harris goes, shall I get the go to the army, sir? And, and Andrews goes, is this Chicago? <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> and, um, you know, they, they don't, they're not armed. So, he, you know. I'll deal with this with a fine speech. That's it. Yeah, exactly. But Andrews, the RSM, knows that if you bring guns out, then it might ramp the situation up. Mm. And if Williams is going to kill Stevens by drilling him, Williams might kill one of them by shooting him. So I think, you know, there's conscious decisions going on. Andrews is the RSM. I think, honestly, he's, he's just, he is phenomenal in that role. He's a standout. Yeah. Standout. All these guys are shouting, Stevens, Stevens, and it ramps and ramps and ramps. And he's like, gets them to quiet down. And there's this one little meek timid private soldier prisoner holding his mess tin and he goes what's your name oliver twist <laughs> put that down you've missed breakfast and he throws his mess tin and this guy's like shitting himself because he's been singled out but the rsm knows single out a weak one because he's yeah. not gonna he's not gonna be mouthy back and he goes what's your name and the guy goes stevens it's like um spartacus almost yeah. And without missing a beat, Andrew's uh, character goes back, Staff, we've got a miracle. A man back from the dead. Take him back to the mortuary. <laughs> <laughs> and before that, take him over the hill before we bury him. <laughs> it's so evil. And it's so, like, a bee sting. But by the end of that scene, he's diffused everything. They've yeah, had a bit he's of, having a laugh. They're having a laugh. Yeah. You know, and everyone's back in their cell. Mm. But it's the way his pronunciation of words and the way he sort of the way he says things and the, the words he chooses to like roll over his tongue and all that. Mm. It's just it, it's a tour de force, that whole bit. Then the allegations of murder start ramping and yeah, someone's actually come forward to say, look, I exactly. will, you know, come forward. McGrath and King basically back up Connery's assertion that that's it, that um, that Williams has murdered Stevens. And, and King's has, King's got his own reasons for for wanting to fight back as well because he's mm. been horrendously racially abused like the whole movie. Yeah, these little constant digs at his sort of his life and his mm-hmm. background. You can see why he, you know, he goes mad. You know, he he yeah. he actually crack properly mentally cracks. Yeah, yeah. You know? But even then, I wasn't even sure if he was doing that because they cracked him or because he knew that was a way that he could act. Yeah. I mean, he wouldn't be able to touch him. It's definitely, definitely true. So you kind of like, there's a great scene where he resigns from the British army, which (laughs) he can't really do, but he takes off, he takes off his uniform and he starts ripping his clothes up and he's hysteric, you know? Mm. And at that point, you know, I I think he's definitely bloody army. Exactly. You definitely get the feeling that he is really, you know, he's, he's become unhinged. He's broken. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's screaming out that, you know, None of this is fair. I don't want to be in this army anymore. Yeah, yeah. So and he, you know, and he he gets marched to the commandant's office for the interview mm. of like you know, explaining that Williams has killed Stevens, and he yeah. you know he goes in his underwear. So he's marching across the you know the square Dublin in. Well, actually, no. He, he so he, that's the only time you see anyone walk in the film. He basically yeah, yeah. walks because he refuses to yeah. double. And it's Harris like shouting at him, double, double, and he's just not. And Harris finds this amusing. He does really. But, yeah he can't show it but when he's in the sort of confined space with the commandant and and jacko you see him like i can't control him yeah yeah but he like has a little wry smile as if he's loving every minute of it and J- jacko takes cigarettes and sits ice great yeah he does yeah. he's sort of like he's in, he's in his under, underpants and he's sat on the the, the commandant's like yeah. sofa Says smoking lounge. one of yeah. his yeah smoking one of his <laughs> cigarettes and he's yeah i like this brand know, yeah, <laughs> and the um, the commandant's like in complete and utter shock about yeah. what's going on, and then there's a flip change moment where 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 King basically turns to him. Jacko King goes, and don't forget, Williams murdered Stevens, mm. and then he just sort of like saunters like, out again. Yeah, and then the commandant's like, what, what, what? 
Because at that point, the commandant doesn't even know that someone's died. Doesn't even understand anyone's died, yeah. You know, and, and the RSM's gone to sort his funeral, mm. which Stephen's funeral, but even the commandant doesn't even know. No. So it's this, this other layer of like, well, who's in command? After Williams is sort of trying to cover his own back and win sort of personal battles with uh, Sean Connery's character. And Sean gets brutally beaten mm. by Williams and a couple of others. He lowers him into a fight, doesn't he? By saying he'll he'll fight him one on one in like a in, in the solitary cell. Turns around and, and there's two other screws with him, and he yeah, yeah, you know, they pin him to a wall and they beat beat the beat hell out of him. Beats into a pulp, almost breaks his mm. leg, breaks his foot, and that becomes one of the cruxes of the story. So they're, they're trying to get the medical officer to send him to a hospital to get him out of the prison, mm. so that he's safe from Williams. Because there's a very real likelihood that Williams will somehow find a way to kill him. Yeah. Getting Sean out of the picture will enable him to go and report all these people. So they don't want him leaving. William's trying to say, oh, he's fine. Nothing happened. We had, we had, He fell over or whatever. You've got Harris trying to go, look, you're the medical orderly. You need you outrank everyone here. Well, yeah, he's a captain. He's a captain, yeah. It's like the medical officer's forgotten that he's a captain. Mm. Yeah, and, it's it's weird. It's, he's so like in like a in like a, a daze isn't he really mm. and he's just clearing people fit for punishment because he's always like oh it's too hot it's too yeah. hot I've had enough of this you know he does mention on one one at least one occasion where it's like it's it's, it's too hot for the prisoners you probably shouldn't be doing that <laughs> yeah it's totally no one cares do they no you know Very he doesn't meek. speak up for himself until the end and he you yeah. know he's he's there facing off with Williams and he's demanding that Connery be ready for an ambulance and taken yeah. to the nearest hospital yeah. yeah 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 and the RSM has a as a sort of face off with with uh, with Michael Redgrave's medical yeah, officer yeah. as well about about that and that's the that's the scene where the power struggle comes to the fore mm. and Harris the kindly staff sergeant basically says listen Bert you know RSM Wilson mm you've not been in control of this prison for days. It's Williams. Williams has taken control. Yeah. It wasn't until that point I I, I didn't really I didn't really twig that that was what no. was going on. I didn't see it either. No, because that whole powerful scene of of the RSM breaking up the mutiny, that struck me as he's still he's still very much in control mm. of this. But I suppose you could say that the very fact that a mutiny occurred showed that he'd lost control because of, you know, what Williams had been, you know, doing. Williams sort of black tries to blackmail Redgrave, doesn't he? Yes. Like, and well, you've you passed him fit for punishment. All I was doing was punishing him. It's you mm. that you that did it. And the RSM's kind of shocked by this, I yeah, think. Yeah. He he's sort of looking at Williams as if to say like You cheeky bastard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then he He, he sort of has to go along with yeah, it. Yeah, for like saving face. Mm. And then the Michael Redgrave twigs and goes, this is blackmail. How dare mm. you? Yeah. Now we're sort of seeing that everyone is trying to cover their own backs apart from Redgrave. And he says, right, I'm going to send for an ambulance. We're going to get you out of here, Connery. But he goes away. And then you've got Williams and Andrew's character. They have a, they have a bit of a, an argument. The RSM, then he strikes Williams. He does. No, yeah. no one gives me orders. No one. And he like, he raises his, his, um, Kane at him. I think that's the moment he realizes that he has lost control. Mm. Williams is almost like he wants him to hit him. He's, he yeah. go, he goads him into it, and you can tell mm. Williams Williams's character out of the film must have been this sort of like jumped up little Napoleon sort of man who l- feeds off bitter energies and things. <laughs> Everyone's mean in this movie. There's no nice people. No. It's such a, it's such a weird film. And then there is no plot until that point. <laughs> no, the film should almost start there. Mm. shouldn't it it's such an odd sort of it's like a day in the life before that mm. moment it is yeah and all the while sean's witnessing all this and he says look i'm gonna put all of this in my report he's pretty desperate at this point isn't very he? You know, desperate like, yeah you can hear it in connery's voice he's like I'm, I'm i'm gonna report all of this you know he's like he hates the army by this point he's had enough of being he in does. the army. he's completely he... despondent and you know when the the, the uh, medical officer goes off to organize the ambulance he feels like he's won Mm, mm. It finally feels like he's won, and there's there's a point where the the RSM after the after that altercation with Williams leaves mm. to go and help organise the the ambulance and inform the commandant of what's been going on. 
Nessie, yeah. And basically, McGrath, uh, Jack Jack uh, Watson's Jock McGrath character, and Ozzy Davis's uh, Jack O'King set upon Williams when he goads them. Yeah. And Connery just looks on, completely despondent and and desperate for them to stop, stop. because he knows if they continue to beat him, then they've all lost. Yeah, there'll be no case because they're all they're all gonna automatically side with the prison staff, yeah. and I can totally get why Sean is sort of he's mm. like please stop. And the the end of the movie is Sean. There's this low sort of shot of Sean Connery's mm. face, and you yeah. can just hear the beating, yeah, going on in the background. Yeah, and he, he he's just so despondent. Yeah, and he's like, please, we we'd won, we'd won. Sean Connery's acting. He actually acts in this movie. Yes. And that's one of the reasons he took the film, isn't it? You know, he wanted something to stretch his abilities as an actor rather than just being known for Bond. The Hill definitely does that. Mm. It's a fascinating character piece that brings out a hell of a lot out of all of the actors involved. Mm. And you get this, you're sort of following this, this brief story of probably like over a couple of days, isn't it really? Yeah, I think so. And the brutality comes through and, you know, the despondency of the prisoners in the face of this brutality becomes so much that they have to say something. They have to try and do something. Yeah. And when they finally on the brink of winning, you know, and proving that this sadistic staff sergeant has been cruelly treating them and has led to the death of one of them. Yeah. That slips away from Connery. And yeah, in, in his face, you can see that slip away. If he and survives, then, who knows? Because the film cuts away and that's how it ends. It cuts and you get, it goes to black and just says the hill and you get the sound of a, a prison door locking and then the credits roll. There's no just desserts. I mean, you could you could argue that Williams getting beaten up is punishment enough, but it's not because you know- But it, in, doesn't, it doesn't feel cathartic. Doesn't None of it does. None. No. And that's, that's the thing with Lume's films. Or the ones that I've seen anyway, where I feel like you don't get a just desserts with Lume movies. Mm. You know, at the end of the hill, you're like, what happened? Tell me. Like, yeah, I need there's, to there's know. no resolution. Yeah. Basically. Not none at all. But it's a phenomenal film. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's a testament. Yeah. It's a testament to all their acting abilities that mm. they carry this character piece to a point where you're so invested. Definitely. And it's a sort of Looking back now, I'm, you know, such a shame and, and, and sad that Connery is no longer with us because over the last few weeks, I think a lot of us have been watching Connery's movies that not that aren't Bond. Yeah. And actually, we're... He'll forever be Bond, but... He'll forever be Bond, but... He was so much more of an actor. He's so much more. And in movies like The Hill, he really, really shows his acting chops. Mm. And he's really talented. And he actually he can show... You know, he's not just this big... This big imposing Scottish man. He's he's actually a quite a nuanced actor when he wants to be. Yeah. Because there are moments in the hill where you feel like he's a completely different person. You know, he is Joe Roberts who who beat up his his CO. We would implore you from everyone at, at Fighting on Film HQ that this movie is is one to hang Sean Connery's legacy on. Exactly. It's one that we, you know, as soon as we heard the sad news that he he died that. We thought, what films can we cover on the pod that would, you know, showcase Connery as the iconic actor that he mm. is? Um, and you know, we thought The Hill was just the obvious choice. Yeah, because it's such a powerful performance. Definitely, you know, I, I was saying to to Matt before we started recording, you know, I could definitely see him in Command of Matilda too. You yeah. know, he he looked very much like Tank Commander stock. So, Matt, any final thoughts? I think The Hill's just one of those iconic films that grow. So while it might not have been an instant classic, I think it's certainly for those who are uh, fans of Connery and you know fans of, of that kind of film, that kind mm. of war film, it's, it's sort of become one of those classic films that are very character-based. So, you know, like Bridge of River Kwai is very character-based. You know, and and this is this is a, a very strong character movie, I think, mm. and it's got that brilliant cast of classic British character actors, yeah, and 
and the film was nominated for six BAFTAs, and it only won the cinematography, the photography BAFTA. But for American listeners, a BAFTA is a British Academy Award, basically. It's a sh- it's a shame that it didn't win any more awards. I think they certainly deserved it. I it think. really did because it is an American film. It, it American money behind it, American you know director things like that. Mm, I think it was MGM that, that MGM produced it, wasn't it? Released it, um, produced it. Yeah, so it is a massive cult classic. I think now, rightly so. One hundred percent. Since Lume passed away, all of his movies were sort of got rediscovered, and and the hill sort of is is one of those movies. Well, it just shows the breadth of his you know his ability. You know, he, he could. He could go from being suave bond to you know being a dark, broken tank regiment NCO to, to shooting Nazis in the face in Arnhem. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. We had a lot of nice interaction from you, you guys, when Sean passed away on the day on the day that he did pass. You know, mm. some great tributes to the man over on the uh, Fighting on Film Twitter. If you aren't following us yet, do find us at Fighting on Film. So yeah, we've got loads of things coming up towards Christmas. We've got some great movies we're going to be covering. We mentioned one of them earlier on in the podcast, but we won't give it away just yet. Wild Geese. <laughs> <laughs> Another big thank you again for listening, guys, and we hope you enjoyed The Hill. Thanks for listening, guys. Till next time. Au revoir.